While you're most likely to run into one of these in school, Chromebooks have changed a fair bit since their introduction in 2011, and even more recently there have been a number of significant changes to make these rather interesting machines. I think it's about time we revisit Chromebooks and see what they're like in 2023, and what better to do that with than a brand new one, in this case from Acer, their new Chromebook Plus 515. I'll start off with what's new about Chromebooks in general, and then get into why you might want, or not want, one of these Acer machines. When Chrome OS first launched, it was really pretty basic. It was essentially just the Chrome web browser and a bare bones OS in the background to let you run said browser. Nowadays, it's getting dangerously close to being basically Google's Linux distro. The biggest change came in 2016, with the slow rollout of Android app support for Chrome OS devices. It took a couple of years for that to become a, a stable and usable experience, but now it's pretty solid. A whole bunch of the apps that I use on my Android phone now work pretty easily on Chrome OS. Most still open in a phone-sized window, with the option to change them to a tablet-sized window or resizable, making it act like a regular desktop window. It does warn you for every single app that the app might not support resizability and may break, but the admittedly limited selection of apps I tried, I didn't have any problems. The only point of confusion I have with this is the Play Store. Due to some apps not supporting Chrome OS natively, sometimes when you install an app, say NVIDIA's GeForce Experience, you get a full desktop version. But it's also clear that it is the same app installation because it prompts you to install that exact same app on other Android devices. But other times, you'll get what is clearly an Android app. I can't see any obvious way to know before you install it what you're going to get. Perhaps people more familiar with Chrome OS can enlighten me in the comments. The next major update came in 2018 with the introduction of Crustini, Google's Linux VM solution. It didn't leave beta until 2021, but in short, it lets you have a mostly fully featured Linux, Linux experience, complete with terminal and GUI apps. I installed VS Code, which works fine for the most part. I've even got an example React app running after realizing that you can't create symlinks in the shared storage, but moving all of the, that data just inside the VM storage works fine. This level of Linux support means that while it is still a VM and therefore it's a little bit clunky, you can install and run pretty much anything you need from a Linux machine, but you don't have to deal with the whole reinstall the OS at the slightest sign of a problem type of issue that I always seem to run into. So between the Android support and the Linux VM, Chrome OS is dangerously close to being a Chrome-flavored Linux distro and an actually useful bit of kit. Okay, that jab was not necessarily in good faith, but I must admit that I'm really surprised by just how versatile these machines have become. They went from being a pretty minimal experience, really just a web browser as your operating system, to being a fully featured you know, system with a, a number of locally run tools. It is still a terminally, terminally online type of machine, but with some local storage and not an insignificant amount of horsepower, it is a fairly capable machine. Which I think brings me nicely onto this, the Acer Chromebook Plus 515. The model I have here is the higher end Core i5 model, that being an i5-1235U, complete with 2P cores and 8E cores. It's paired with 8GB of LPDDR5 RAM and 240GB of SSD space. That's a surprising amount of power in a Chromebook. I mean, just looking at the Passmark scores for this i5 versus the Windows price equivalent from Acer, that being an Acer Aspire 3 with a Ryzen uh, 7520U, this Chromebook is 30% faster in all-core work and about the same in single-threaded workloads too. 
I guess that's what you get when you don't have to pay for a Windows license. Now, the display is clearly the, the desired centerpiece here. It's a frankly massive, slim bezeled 1080p 60Hz IPS display with reasonable, if flat, colours to the eye. The display is noticeably dim, even with the brightness setting cranked up to the max, my Spider-X via Moonlight reckoned the display was peaking at less than 300 nits, although with a better contrast ratio than I would expect. I'd definitely like to see more brightness here, and I can't say that this is a, a, an overly accurate nor colour rich display either. This is for consuming media not creating it, although the operating system would suggest that idea as well. Naturally, I did test this with my open source response time tool via Moonlight, just to see how bad it is, and um, yeah, it's, it's not great. Uh, some of the results were into the 30 millisecond range, making this about a 47 hertz equivalent panel. Seeing as it is only running at 60 hertz, I'll let it off with a warning. The keyboard is pretty average, or even a little on the naff side of things. It's kind of worryingly mushy and soft, and I found myself mistyping a fair amount. It's certainly serviceable, and you do get used to it, although something that unnecessarily annoys me is the lowercase font on the non-shine-through keycaps. I don't know why it bugs me, but it does. The backlight does exist, but as I said, the caps aren't shine through, so you'll still struggle to see the keys in the dark. Something you will need to get used to is the altered layout. There's no system key, or at least not on the bottom row. That has been replaced, or that replaced caps lock, and has been filled in with or the space that would normally be filled in with a system key, is just longer control and alt keys. They've also replaced all of the function keys with what would normally be FN plus F key functions, like audio, screen brightness, or just back and refresh buttons. They've also opted to put an alt graph button on the right of the spacebar, instead of something like a context menu key, which I would find a lot more useful. And the keyboard is missing delete, home, page up, page down, and uh, you know, end keys, that sort of thing. Or even a secondary function layer that's obvious to allow you to still use them. That's mostly what annoyed me about using this keyboard, or at least the layouts, because I use those keys incredibly regularly, especially when programming or using CLIs. Now you do have some keyboard shortcuts that mitigate some of those missing functions, like holding the system key and pressing backspace, you get delete back, and holding the control button and then using the arrow keys gets you a close facsimile to home, end, page up and page down, but they aren't quite the same, and of course you'll still have to memorise those binds rather than being able to see what those functions might be on the keyboard itself. As for the trackpad, that's just outright poor. By default, mouse acceleration was on, which drove me crazy, but even once I disabled that, I found that it would regularly miss my movements, not track anywhere near the edges, or would just sometimes skip in and out of movement. It, it drove me mad to use this. I had a USB mouse connected for almost all of my testing purely because of that. I was also somewhat sad to find that this isn't a touchscreen, which I think would, you know, kind of fit a machine like this very well. I suppose that brings me nicely onto the I.O. Considering this is mostly a cloud computing machine, it has a surprising amount of ports. You get one USB-A port, two USB-B Type-C ports, both of which support power in, uh, HDMI, and a combo audio jack. That would rival most MacBooks. You've also got built-in speakers that flank the keyboard, and while they do actually project upwards as you would hope they would, they offer a pretty flat sound profile. They lack bass, as most laptop speakers do, although I would still call them serviceable, and the fact that they are user-facing is a clear benefit. Battery life on the admittedly limited full brightness should net you around 5 hours or so of usage, or at a more conservative brightness level, you should get up to 10 hours. I do have to admit that so long as it's charged, 
The instant wake is just so refreshing. With Windows laptops, it often feels clunky and slow, but with this, you open the shell, and no matter if it's been a minute or a month, you're back where you left off. So, should you buy one? Well, if you're looking to run anything locally, if it isn't Android, an Android app or something that you can fight with the Linux VM to install, you'll probably want to look elsewhere. This isn't a gaming machine either, despite what Google's TV ads might have you believe. It's a good way to get a good user experience out of unequivocally low-end hardware. This model I have is £500, but Acer will sell you an almost identical machine, but with the i3-1215U, a 2P core, 4E core chip, which is still faster than that Ryzen chip, and more than enough for regular Chrome OS usage, for just £400 instead, and I think that's a much better deal. I can't say that I would buy one, but I'm not the target market. For the right person, I can see why this exists and why you'd put your cash here instead of a Windows machine at the same sort of price point. The privacy concerns are still a pretty big problem for me too, but it seems like I might be in the minority there. Of course, with that said, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you think about Chromebooks in 2023 and this Acer Chromebook Plus model as well? Let me know in those comments. I'll leave a link to it in the description if you're interested. And if you want to support the channel, you can pick up my open source latency or response time testing tools at osrtt.com, pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one or a load of other designs or support through Patreon or YouTube. There's loads of different options and loads of links in the description if you're interested. Otherwise, that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next video.